finally tonight, a conversation with an emerging jazz innovator who is now an important voice at one of the country's leading arts institutions. Jeffrey Brown has the story. Jason Moran has made a name for himself at an early age as a jazz pianist and composer, and that name is growing now to a wider public. Last year, Moran was awarded a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and he was recently made the Artistic Advisor for Jazz at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. It's a position held for many years by the great jazz musician and educator Billy Taylor. Jason Moran joins us now. Welcome to you. My pleasure. Thanks. I guess the first question is, why take this on? I mean, you have a busy uh, performing and recording schedule. Why do you want to take a more public role? Well, I mean, I feel like the arts in general in America kind of always continually need boosts, um, revitalization, uh, new energy. And uh, so when the Kennedy Center kind of approached me about this position, I thought this would be a fine opportunity in my current role as, say, performer to then branch out into a way to, uh, to kind of interact with the audience on a different scale. When you say uh, arts need a boost, and then there's jazz, you know, right. I mean, there are certain forms, and we talked a lot on this program, but the sort of sometimes more marginalized form, right? right. They seem that way. Right. What, what, what do you think jazz's role is in our culture today? Well, it's, you know, it's that we can promote the abstract. I think recently I'll, I feel like it's maybe in a way that abstract becomes such a kind of like a, a, a thing that is annoying, you know, that um, it doesn't promote thought unless mm -hmm. it's all laid out and planned for us. So, um, and, and, and improvisational music and jazz really kind of forces us to focus. It, it forces us to have an imagination, uh, to, to create our own ideas about what we're hearing. Or if you go to a museum, or if you go to see a choreographer or a dance company, you know, you really kind of, the audience is really making up their own decisions. Well, I want to promote that, that people, that audiences come in as thinkers, just as much as the musicians or the performers are thinkers. Because that's, I think, for me, it's enticing. It's, in, it's inviting. Well, one of the wonderful contradictions of jazz, or I, I don't know if it's a contradiction, but it always strikes me, is it is something so brand new. Mm -hmm. There's the, the, the improv improvisation, and it's created in the moment. Right. But it also comes from a very long tradition. Right. I know this is something you think a lot about right. because you feel very tied to part of that tradition. Right, right. and it's important, I mean, also for, for the tradition of America, really, the, the music speaks to its history here. Mm -hmm. You know, born out of, you know, one of the more trying times of America, born out of slavery, blues, and gospel, and jazz come out as these freedom musics. These musics that promote thought, they promote uh, consciousness, um, and they promote therapy also, you know, not only for the musicians, but for the audience that is listening. Um, I can't tell you that I'm sure many musicians have these stories where audience members approach them after a concert and say, I came in with the worst attitude, having the worst day in the world, and now after hearing this music, I feel ready to address the world again. How do you bring those together in your own work? I mean, the, I, I've read, for example, that it was your first exposure to Thelonious Monk, right. where everything kind of changed. Right. Do you hold on to that even as you're creating new compositions? Well, well, I have to, because I feel like those musicians, I mean, are kind of part of my DNA. You know, from the years of listening to them, uh, talking to musicians who knew them, studying with certain musicians like a Jackie Byard, or Andrew Hill, or Muha Richard Abrams, these musicians really share something very personal to them with me. Uh, and then they ask that I take their information and apply it in the way that I've grown up to apply things. So it's, uh, it's a constant look back and a look forward and a look at the present, too. And it's what I kind of promote for my students as well at New England Conservatory, is that they think about not only what this kind of vast history of music is, not even just jazz history, but the music in general, and then think about where and how they got to the point where they are, and then how will they disseminate that information? It's all up to them, you know. What about what about uh, contemporary forms of music? Uh, one of the interesting questions for jazz, uh, classical musicians have the same thing, is how do you interact with more popular forms of your day, right. pop music, uh, right. hip hop music, right. uh, that's all around there that many of your contemporaries are listening to. Right, and most, I mean, currently, 
some of the best R&B groups out here are, are using basically an entire jazz band as their rhythm section. Say a person like Maxwell or D'Angelo is now back on the road with it's interesting, musician. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the form that has kind of created this backdrop to so much of the great music of pop music has been really created by forward-thinking jazz musicians as well. So, you know, I listen to a lot of it. It's part of how I grew you up. You do. I listen to a lot of yeah. hip-hop, listen yeah. to a lot of R&B, listen to a lot of current techno and electronica, you know, because uh, the music keeps changing, you know, and I keep look at my twin year old, four-year-old twins and say, I wonder what they'll listen to when they're 13 or 14, <laughs> when music starts to really mm -hmm. matter, you know. At 13 mm -hmm. or 14, I heard Thelonious Monk. And he put into context all of my years of studying Suzuki piano from age six to age 13. All of a sudden, hearing Monk, I said, oh, okay, this instrument is something that I hadn't thought about before. Is that how you started as a, as a, as a child, with Suzuki yeah. piano? Uh, yes, fortunately. Really? <laughs> I say fortunately now. It was unfortunate when I was seven years old, because who wants to practice piano? But mm -hmm. my parents had me in Suzuki classes with a fantastic teacher, Yelena Kuranets, who really thought, taught me about the basics and the technique of the piano, but also the love and the passion that would then grow. I mean, I don't know how she planted this seed. It was amazing how she did this because now when I go back to Houston to perform, she's there sitting in the audience still commenting on my technique. And what, really? <laughs> and what was there music all around in in your family? No, I'm, my parents were they were arts appreciators, mm -hmm. you know, and and my brothers. So they stuck my brothers and I in, in Suzuki classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if anything, that's what we want. That's what I want for kind of American public is that they're arts appreciators. That then you don't actually have to be an artist to, to expose your children to it or expose yourself to it. Uh, it's just to interact with it. And then maybe one of the children will catch the bug and, uh, and decide that they want to create or they want to create and then, then promote their creativity. You know? All right, Jason Moran, pianist, composer, now the artistic advisor for Jazz at the Kennedy Center. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you.